here's the thing. We've been, we've been walking through Corinthians. And uh, 1 Corinthians is Paul's, you know, friendship letter to the Corinthians. And, and I, I feel like at this point in the letter, if you've received this from someone that you respect and honor, and you've gotten all the way through to this point, and you haven't burnt this letter yet or deleted this letter from your inbox, you're in for a penny, in for a pound. This is Paul just going, seriously, you guys seriously. And last week we heard from Pastor Stan preaching through chapter 5, where, where they had to talk about the most foolish of human behaviors, and they had to call it out. And they had to say, you know what, those behaviors, especially around sexual immorality, was destroying the unity of the church. It was Christians behaving badly. And Paul is essentially saying, I spent a long time giving you a great foundation. We go back to chapter 2, and we talk about the, the chapter 1, I should say, and he talks about the foundation of gold that that is there for the people of Corinth to, to, to build a church upon. And it's like the, the sin of the city has leached into the righteousness of the church and is starting to disperse it and take it over. And these people are sitting in a space where they honestly believe that they've got this so right that they can let this amount of sin in and, and, uh, and, and God will still bless it. And Paul's saying, you're wrong. And he, and he says this phrase six times in this next chapter, do you not know? Do you not know? It's one of those sort of rhetorical questions that Paul asks that says, I know you know because I know I taught this to you. Why do you not know this? So Paul's about to lead us through a couple of thoughts that will probably land as truth when you hear them, but as challenge when you put them into practice. Is that all right with everyone? Let's just start in, in, in one, well, he wrote Romans 2, but we'll start in 1 Corinthians 8. It says this, Knowledge puffs up, but love's build, love builds up. This is just verse 1 and 2. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. A man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. The person that loves God is known by God. We don't know enough to presume that we are wise enough to look after all of the big decisions that need to be made. And that's why we do it in community and unity and in complex relationships like we do in church life. Knowledge puffs up. What Paul is saying is, you might have a lot of knowledge. In other words, what I'm about to say might make sense to you because it kind of aligns with your knowledge. But it hasn't yet sunk to that place in you that makes it wisdom. Wisdom is the, is the ability to be able to be like Jesus, and instead of going this or that, there's somewhere in the middle. Jesus is always a somewhere in the middle kind of answer, right? He's the guy that when you ask him a question, might not answer the question, but instead might bend down in the sand until you get a revelation. Yeah? That's the Jesus we're talking about. And so Paul is, Paul is laying this foundation of gold, and he's saying the knowledge that you have is just puffing you up. But if you were to get a hold of the love that I've taught you about, the sacrificial love that I've taught you about, then maybe you could pay attention to a few of these things, and they might just become revelation. So let's just dive right in here, because it's kind of a, well, it's, you know, Paul just winds up for another slap, really. That's really what he's doing right here. It starts this way. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it out before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? How dare you? It's not a bad way to start your conversation, isn't it? Getting up in your face and just going, how dare you? Paul's addressing what's going on in the church, which is essentially tension from brother to brother, sister to sister, tension within the church. He's talking about ordinary matters. He's not talking about the kind of crimes where you need to report things to the police, okay? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about ordinary matters where you have come into dispute with another Christian person. And that dispute has gone so far because you haven't dealt with it properly that now you've decided to take it into the public sphere and to a public court. Now, Paul is not the kind of guy that ignores the law. In fact, he appealed to the law a couple of times in his own journey. In Acts 22, he, he comes, remember, he's about to get flogged and he kind of goes, hey guys, I'm a Roman citizen. And at that point, they freak out and go, we're not allowed to do this. In other words, Paul believes in the law of the land and he's okay with it. He's not saying ignore the law of the land. He's not saying the church has such a separate law that these two things don't go side by side. At another point in Acts 24, before Felix, he appeals to the law of Rome as well. He is a smart, smart man. What he's saying to us is Christian to Christian should be different. 
Christian to Christian should have a different process. And it certainly should not get to the point where the tensions are that high that you would decide to embarrass somebody by bringing it into the public sphere. I'm guessing maybe a modern version of that might be if you jump onto social media and begin to slander someone just to prove that you're right. And then use the words, but God bless you at the end. <laughs> Any, <laughs> you ever been in an argument and someone goes, with respect, <laughs> you're a jerk. It's like the, the, the with respect bit doesn't count. <laughs> you can't say with respect. What Paul's saying is you can't take this into the public sphere and expect this not to become an embarrassment for you and not to chip away at the unity of the church. And certainly you should know that if that's how we represent ourselves in the public sphere, then trust of the church is going to drop and drop and drop. And we've seen that happen throughout the ages. So this is what it says in verse 2. Do you not know? Remember? Paul's saying you should know this. And possibly your knowledge that puffs you up has told you you do know this, but this hasn't sunk into wisdom. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Sorry, what? Hold that thought for a second. And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? <laughs> How many people would like to judge the world? Where are the saints in the house? Saints? Any saints? Scotty, right in there, love it. <laughs> Where are the saints in the house? If you're a follower of Christ, you're a saint. Get them up. Like you just don't care. Put your hands up for Detroit, no. If you're a saint, you have been called to judge the world. Not be judgmental, but to create a measure against which a godly life should be measured. Verse 3, do you not know that we will judge angels? I'm sorry, seriously? Angels? We're going to judge the world on angels. We're going to judge, just, just let that spin through your brain for a second. And start to understand that Paul is saying to us that somewhere in the divine plan for this earth, is a God who says, I have chosen you and set you apart. I have set you apart so much that I don't want you to be in conflict with one another. More than that, I want you to hold such a high standard that you will be able to be righteous in judgment of others, and not only that, in the judgment of angels. Now, let's just, let's just play that out for a second. There, the, 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 there, are, there are angels and there are demons, yeah? We're okay with that? We understand that the, the weapons of this world, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. There is a supernatural fight going all the time for your soul. In other words, the enemy is trying to get into the camp and say, did God really mean that? Did God really mean this for good? Did God really go before you? Did he really save your soul? That's the enemy going on, right? And that's a bunch of fallen angels being led by a guy named Lucifer who was in on God's plan to create a humanity that would bring glory to him and Lucifer wanted the glory and that's why Lucifer fell. And this is the point where, where Paul is saying to us, we will actually be in judgment of the lower angels or the demons that have tried to overtake our world, that have tried to take us astray. In other words, what we are building here is a movement, a measure against which the enemy will be measured. It's a pretty wild idea. I'll give you that. But it says it right there, and I trust the Word of God. And that messed with me when I read it this week. But hopefully it starts to, it starts to put some weight under what you understand salvation to be. That you are being matured into, saved into the image of Christ. You are the representative of him on the earth. In other words, we are being asked to do more than. We are asked to be in but not of. We are asked to take a hold of the righteousness afforded to us through the foolishness of the cross and live that out. You're going to judge the world. Congratulations. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, remember he says trivial cases, ordinary cases, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even uh, men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you, he says. Even men of little account. Just anyone. Just get anyone to try it. 
Is there no one wise among you, he says? Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers, but instead one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers? Here's what I know about humanity, because I am human, and because I have created humans, and they live in my house. I know that good behavior is often preceded by the promise of a reward. Yes? If you want to get the child to be quiet, you give the child ice cream. Now, just hold that thought. Just talk amongst yourselves because I've just I've got a bit of a reward ready. So, just hold that thought. Just talk amongst yourselves for a second. Yeah, baby. We'll start the bidding at 200. (laughs) If you're a good Christian tonight, this could be yours. All right? You with me? You with me? This is important. This is how important this is. Karen didn't want me to do this because the bottom line of the church just fell out. Right? So we are giving away gold tonight. It says this in verse 7. The very fact that you have lawsuits amongst you means that you have been completely defeated already. Completely defeated already? Wait. Those who have victory because of the power of the cross are completely defeated because a trivial thing has been pushed so far that you've embarrassed the community in front of a public court? Yeah. Completely defeated. If you can't handle the trivial matters amongst you, defeat is where it lands. And I love this. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? What's the reward set out in front of us? What's the thing we're chasing after? The kingdom. And not only in eternity, but the kingdom here right now, where we can show unity and complex community and and we can represent the love and the mercy and the grace of God. That's what we're going for. That's the reward. And yet, if we let these little squabbles get to this point, we are defeated already and we have no reward. What's wickedness? Well, wickedness is easy. That's easy to describe. If you do not possess the ability to love others and love your God above all, above, above all else, then you will ignore the orphan and the widow, and you will ignore Micah 6, 8, where it says, to love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly. And you will let the poor get poorer, and you will let the isolated get more isolated, and you will ignore the the, the broken down person on the side of the road. See, God is a God that interrupts us over and over and over again to say, hello, 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 I want you to be my hands and my feet. But that starts, my friends, with you being able to look in the mirror in the morning and say, I like that person. Love your neighbor as you love your self, right? It's really, really hard to love your neighbor when your neighbor doesn't look like you or sound like you or smell like you or have the finances that you have or the house that you have or whatever it is. It's hard. But unless you can look in the mirror and say, I like that person, it's going to stay hard. And so when you look in the mirror and, and, and you recognize the preciousness of your salvation, and the journey that you are on toward kingdom, you can say, thank you, God, for the breath in my lungs. Thank you, God, that I get to go and be your hands and feet today. Thank you that I get to love mercy and do justice and walk humbly. Love, do, walk. Love, do, walk. Love, do, walk. Love, do, walk. Just keep walking. Loving and doing and walking and loving and doing and walking. It's hard to do this, but it is worthwhile to do this. And if you don't do that, basically what happens is you start focusing inward. And once you start focusing inward, it becomes about you. And once it becomes about you, these little squabbles become bigger than they need to be. And now you're in a place of defeat because you think it's all about you. 
And it ain't. Never has been. The reason we sing these worship songs is to bring the glory to God. The reason we teach each other from the Word of God is to lead each other into the presence of God and into an understanding of who we are in Christ. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have to capture what Paul is saying. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We do not preach or sing to give you knowledge. We preach and sing to give you testimony so that you can see the power of Christ at work in our lives, so that you can be built up in the love that is shared in a complex community like this one. You need to understand the precious weight of your own salvation. There's a couple of songs that I was thinking about this week. Uh, Rich Mullins is one of my favorite singer-songwriters. He, he passed away in the mid-90s, but he wrote some incredible uh, pieces of music. Most people know the song Awesome God. That, that, was, that was Rich Mullins. And he, he, he wrote some incredible... He was, for me, a bit of a psalmist. He was one of those guys. And on an album called uh, Liturgy Legacy and a Ragamuffin Band, if you haven't heard that album, go listen to it. It's, uh, it's one of the greatest albums ever written. That's just a little plug. But, <laughs> but he wrote a song called Hard. And the lyric just says, it's hard, so hard, it's hard to be like Jesus. He says, it's hard to be a man of peace, and it's hard to be like Jesus. And I play that for myself every now and again, because I'm reminded that that's exactly how it feels. It's it's really hard to take a scripture like that and, and be okay with being wronged and be okay with being cheated, just to be able to walk away and be at peace. But that's what the scripture promises us. Of course, the other song that was going through my head was by those other prophets called the Beatles. And there's a song they wrote uh, called, um, that goes, um, try to see it my way. What is it? We can work it out. Do you know that? We can work it out. Life is very short. There's some over 40 singing with you. And there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friends. Little tip, if you're putting that on your playlist, get the Shaka Khan version too. That's free. That's just some free advice. Not in the scripture. Just a good song. We can work it out. How do we work it out? We go to the red letters. We go to the words of Jesus. So let's go to Matthew 18 together. And let's check this out. Matthew 18 is a place where Jesus talks about how to work with a brother who sins against you. Now, here's what you need to know about Matthew 18. It starts, it starts with, the, with the disciples having one of those really wise conversations about who is the greatest in the kingdom. Really clever conversation to be having around, you know, the Son of God. Uh, you know, well, I mean, you've got the Son of God right there. You may as well ask him, you know, do I get to sit at your right hand? And Jesus does this wonderful thing of taking a child and putting the child in the middle of the conversation and saying, unless you come as this child, you will not inherit, you will not get the prize, you will not inherit the kingdom unless you come as a child. Then he follows through with the story about the the 99 and the 1. You you know this parable, right? Jesus says, a a shepherd, if he sees 99 and he's missing one sheep, will he not make sure the 99 is safe and then go after the 1 and bring that 1 back safely? To the fold. He's talking about the Father's heart for His children, for His creation, for the redemption of His cre- creation, the reconciling of them under Himself. This is really, really important stuff to Jesus. It should be really, really important stuff to us. So we talk about being as a child. We talk about going after the one and forgetting about ourselves. And then he comes to this point in uh, Matthew 18 and verse 15. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In other words, the one-on-one hasn't worked. But there's some other people that have observed this problem too. And I need to bring them along and say, look, mate, honestly, here's some other witnesses to what's going on. We think you need to deal with that. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, tell it to the ecclesia. And if he refuses to listen to even them, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, again, Jesus is never this or that. There's always someone, there's something in the middle. And there's some wisdom in here that we need to grab. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? With love. He kind of ate with them and hung out with them and said, it's all right. But here he's tapping into the disciples and their bias. 
He's saying, I know, I know that you think of these people as sinners in the first place. So look, once you get to the end of this process, if the person doesn't understand the love you've given them, then, then you have to push them out and say, go deal with that. Pastor Stan preached last week from the previous chapter that we need to love people enough to, to help them grow, to help them go and work their stuff out. Sometimes there are disputes so strong in church life that we need to say to someone, go away for a while, work it out and come back. There is always reconciliation. But I've been in ministry long enough to know that trouble can brew in these communities that can be really, really destructive. And what Jesus is saying is, go through this process, go one-on-one. Now, some of you are thinking about the conflicts that you've had and you think, I I couldn't go one-on-one with that person, I wouldn't feel safe. So feel free to jump to step two, that's okay. Take two or three witnesses. Bring the elders in. We have a church council. Do you know we have a grievance process in our church because we are so serious about this? Karen, our head of HR, has put together a grievance process that is very simple and very clear. And if you have a grievance with a brother or sister in the church, we have a process that you can go through that's very safe and very well-rounded and includes our pastors, includes our elders, and includes mediation as, uh, at, at the end point. We care about those things that are troubling you. And we certainly care if there are things that are troubling you between you and another brother or sister. That's how serious we are. But that last point is right, right, right at the end of that process. Because we want to try our best to reconcile to each other. Do you know, though, that that trial is just part of the Christian walk? In uh, in Acts 14, I love it, this is Paul and Barnabas, and they they come along and they've done a whole missionary journey, and they've gone through Antioch and Pisidia and all these cities, and and they come to some of the Christians and they say, you know what, we just want to encourage you in Christ. We want to encourage that that you're doing a great job. And it says this, they encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. (laughs) Ha ha, huzzah. Remember, the kingdom is the reward. The kingdom is where we're headed. That's, that's the upfront goal. We want the kingdom here on earth. We want to represent Christ well. But there are hardships that come with that. And there, there are times when you have to separate yourself from all sorts of trouble. You have to walk away having felt like the loser only to know that he's going to give you the victory in the end. But there will be some scars along the way. Toza put it this way. He said... Note well the biographies of all the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and you shall discover none of those whom God made vessels of mercy who were not made to pass through the fire of affliction. It is ordained of old that the cross of trouble should be engraven on every vessel of mercy as the royal mark whereby the king's vessels of honor are distinguished. You are distinguished by the marks that your trials leave behind. Anyone getting a little uncomfortable with this kingdom stuff yet? It's troubling, right? It's hard to be a man of peace. It's hard to be a woman of peace. It's hard to be like Jesus. In Genesis 35, we see the birth of one of Jacob's sons to his wife, Rachel. Rachel, whom he loved. You know the story of Rachel? He worked pretty hard to get Rachel. And Rachel, in giving birth to this son, is dying. She's dying. And the nurse delivers the baby and says, your baby is born. And she names the baby Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. And then she dies. And Jacob picks up his son and says, no, I'm, I'm not calling him that. I'm calling him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And of course, Benjamin was the father of one of the tribes. And out of that tribe came a few famous people, you might remember. But I look at that, at, at that, at that history and I go, that, that's, that's, that's not fair. That's just not fair. It's, it's not fair that Rachel, through, through bearing a son, would lose her life. It's, it's not fair that Jacob had to 
lose Rachel but gain a son, had to, had to grieve and love at the same time. That's not fair. But isn't that sort of the picture of life? And, and our God can use all of these things. All of these things. Rachel left a mark on our history. Jacob left a mark on our history. Benjamin left a mark on our history. And all Jacob had to do was rename him. And so, no, this son is a blessing, not a curse. This son is going to bring joy, not sorrow. Right? And I'm telling you that if you want to take that a little further, there are those that would name you (laughs) names that you don't want to be named. And then there's the name that God gives you, which is son or daughter of the Most High God. Yeah, And that's the name you want. And that's the name you want to say to yourself when you stare at that person in the mirror in the morning and say, I'm okay with that person because I'm a son or I'm a daughter of the Most High God. I uh, did a little exercise this week reading through Isaiah 53. And uh, you might want to try this too. But, but I, I just kind of called it um, Me versus Isaiah 53. Uh, it's a new game that I play, and uh, I read the prophecy once more of, of, of who Jesus was prophesied to be, and, and this is how Isaiah 53 goes from verse 3. It says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. And I started to think about my complaints in life and I kind of went line by line of of kind of what Jesus went through, my complaints of being deceived or ripped off or wronged or the unfair. So I kind of went like this. But I was deceived. He was despised. But I was ripped off. He was rejected. But I was wronged. He was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, This is not fair. How many people have made that complaint? This is just not fair. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. And the the biggest one for all of us is just this one. I want justice. That's what I want. And I've got my picture of what justice should be. But this is what the scripture says. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him And by his wounds, we are healed. Do you not know? My friends, I stand here right now and I have to confess to you that I have lived a Christian life, uh, you know, by name my whole life. There have been times that I have not represented Christ and his church well. Hopefully there are many more times that outweigh those times. But I have been in conflict with Christian brothers and sisters. And and I have applied these things and I've worked, I think, very, very, very hard. But there have been relationships that I have had to walk away from. I have had to lose, yeah? I have had to be the one that walks away and, and says, this is not my battle to win. And sometimes, I must say, in my own pride, I have felt completely ripped off. That was not my fault. I should not have had to pay a price for something I did not do. And then you hear this echo from heaven. (laughs) But I did. (laughs) I've had to step away from people that that I desperately love and wanted to reconcile with, but couldn't. And I've had to look in the mirror at times and say, Justin, it was your fault. But the damage is done. And and that's the human experience. I don't stand here today saying, I have done so well at this that everybody I've ever loved still loves me back. Everybody that I've ever helped and and, and, and stretched my resources for has, 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 has returned the favor. It doesn't work that way. Because in the end, I need to understand that I'm not doing it just for you. I'm doing it on behalf of. 
And I'm going to lead a life of love and peace and mercy and grace as best I possibly can. But sometimes I act out of knowledge instead of out of wisdom. And knowledge that is puffed up and said, you're right, keep going, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'm sure you've never done that. And it's really hard. And I've been married a while now. And I'm still married. So I've admitted I was wrong a fair few times now. But it's still hard because my pride gets in the way. And I'm a pretty good debater. I did well in high school debate teams. I can argue any point. And then the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and says, just walk away. Paul says it this way. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Do you not know? that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. And my goodness, I don't want to be counted among the wicked. I, I want to be one that, that loves and does and walks. Loves mercy and does justice and walks humbly. That's the gospel in six words. Micah 6, 8, that's the entire story in six words. But here's the question for all of us here. Here's just a couple of principles that I, I think we should write down and we should hold on to and we should ask ourselves, why don't we know this? Why isn't this wisdom? Why isn't this anchored deep inside my soul? Do you not know forgiveness? Do you not know forgiveness? Do you know how forgiven you are? Do you know how forgiving you can be because of how forgiven you are? Do you not know reconciliation? Do you not know what Jesus did to reconcile us to himself? If you know that, you can be that. Do you not know justice? The punishment that should have been us, on us was on him, and, 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 and we have peace because of that punishment that was on him. Do you not know mercy? Do you understand how much mercy you have been shown, therefore how much mercy you can give? Do you understand humility? Do you not know humility? My goodness, one of the greatest skills any of us can learn, and I'm putting both hands in the air, you, learning to be humble and say I'm wrong. Or at least humble enough to walk away from an argument that's going nowhere but in circles and getting louder and stronger and more hurtful and more hurtful, one that might actually lead us into the public sphere where slander starts to happen, Christian person to Christian person, and then the integrity of the church is chipped away out once more. And isn't this just the kicker for Paul? Do you not know maturity? He grew up before us like a tender root. Yeah. Isaiah 53. Read it through and understand who Jesus was and what he did for you. And these things will start to go from knowledge, knowing that Jesus did that, to understanding why he did that and what that means for you. And the weight of your salvation will start to sink in. And when you come into conflict with another, you will start with the foundation of, if that's the weight of my salvation, then that's the weight of your salvation. And if I can understand the mercy and the justice and everything that's been applied to my life, then I can overlay that on your life. And perhaps this conflict doesn't happen in the first place. But let's be honest, friends. Conflict does happen. And and if conflict happens, we have processes to deal with it so that it doesn't become that complete defeat that Paul talked about. Do you not know that the kingdom is at hand, that we are to walk away from the trivial so we can walk toward the eternal? We've got to walk away from the trivial so we can walk toward the eternal. The only thing I'm waiting to hear, honestly, is well done, good and faithful servant. Do you not know that that's the entire, that's, that's the goal, that's what we're talking about right here. That's the reward. The reward is that you can walk in times of trial and times of trouble and times of stress and times where we're watching people fight over rolls of toilet paper right now. Because we're worried that we won't be looked after. And yet as Christians, we are called to offer our goods to others. To feed others, to look after others, to see those broken down, to, 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 to love mercy and do justice and walk humbly. 
Do you not know? Friends, tonight, the only thing that we need to understand is you already knew this stuff before I started talking about it. It's kind of that rhetorical question. Do you not know? Yeah, of course I know. Has it become who you are? Do you not know that's the whole point of why we teach? That's the whole point of why we worship? That's the whole point of why we share testimony one to another so that we can become more like Christ so that an outside world that doesn't even understand the context for our conversation starts to see the testimony of our life and the mercy and the justice and the grace that we can give. Do you not know? This is a strange, strange time to be alive. But friends, even though the way we do church may have to change over the next few weeks, the way we do faith doesn't. That stays the same. And that's my challenge to me and that's my challenge to you. And I know our whole leadership team is is, is passionate about seeing this church being the hands and feet of, of, of Jesus in a community that desperately needs what Jesus gave you. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the grace and the mercy that you have shown to us. We thank you for the blessing it is to know salvation. We thank you for the blessing it is to know forgiveness, to know grace, to know mercy. We thank you that you paid a debt you didn't owe so that we could come before the throne, lay our burden down, ask for forgiveness and receive it. Lord, I pray a blessing on everyone that is in this house right now and for everyone who could not be with us that's watching online and and, and trying to absorb some of this. Maybe they're in isolation. We don't know, Lord, but we just pray for those that we stand in the gap for and ask that they would know your hand right now, your hand of peace and your hand of mercy. We thank you for all of these things. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen.